Welcome to Southport Baptist Church, an American Baptist Church located at the corner of Banta and McFarland Roads in Southport, Indiana. Sunday morning service begins at 9.30 and we invite everyone to join us. Now let's join Pastor Jeff as he delivers today's message. And we read. Okay, now you'll need to turn it down. I've, I, I turn my uh, mic off, and, and I can always see him back there doing this. It's like, oh, oh my goodness, he's not talking. Anyway, this is uh, John 12, 37. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. Now, I want you to realize something uh, that had, had many things that already occurred. By this time, in Jesus' ministry, he had already raised people who were dead. He had already brought sight to the blind. He had cleansed lepers. He had healed the sick. He had walked on water. He had fed 5,000 men, probably 20,000 people total, with five barley loaves and two small fish. And right before this, a voice had just been heard, this verse here, a voice had just been heard from heaven proclaiming the glory of God and still after he had performed so many signs, it says, in their presence, the Bible says they would not believe in him. I want you to know something. Unbelief is a tricky thing. I've had many people tell me that they didn't believe in the Bible, and my response almost every time, and I, this is not an exaggeration, every time my response has been, well, have you read it? I have only had two responses by dozens and dozens of people, and those two responses have been, well, no, I haven't. And the second response is, well, I've read parts of it. Now, for those who choose unbelief over belief in God, from what I have seen, from what I have heard, studied, and experienced, I think they are choosing a view of the universe that is out of step with reality and that it is impossible to live consistently in unbelief. Every attribute in ourselves, every sense we possess, every thought that we imagine infers something else. Does anybody know what the I, the existence of the I, infers? Some might say sight. If you did, that would be okay. But the eye really infers that there is light. There are animals and fish and insects that have been discovered that live well below the earth in caves and, and, uh, and, and where there's no light at all. And, and when there is no light, eventually they lose sight. And I infers sight. Now, what do you think an ear infers? Sound. Correct. And, and, and sight infers light, and the ear infers sound. Now, how about a conscience? What does the existence of a conscience infer? Now, I will answer that question in a bit, but let me build this up a little bit more. When a lion kills a wildebeest, do you think that he or she feels bad about it? No. Doubtful. In fact, the truth is the lion probably feels badly if the wildebeest gets away. Now, when a crocodile pulls Aunt Tilly's cocker spaniel from the yard and eats it, do you think it feels guilty? Or does it imagine that course number two is two yards down in the form of a shih tzu named Fluffy? <laughs> My money is on course number two. We used to have a cat by the name of Snowball. Or rather, if you looked at how Snowball interacted with the Stratton family, Snowball had humans that were named Jeff, Gail, April, J, and Katie. Now, Snowball was a pretty good mouser. And Snowball never felt guilty when she killed a mouse. In fact, Snowball always seemed rather proud of the fact that she was able to kill these little defenseless little creatures. So proud, in fact, that she would often bring
bring them to us and plop their little lifeless bodies in front of us and then walk around like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> yeah, that's mine. <laughs> that's not, yeah, I did it. I did it. She didn't feel bad in the least. <coughs> now, I want, you, I want you to understand something. No other creature on the earth seems to have a conscience. Why would humans have such a thing? Now, I return to the argument of last week about sociopaths hiding the bodies. As, you know, I, I have, we are, and, and the reason that only human beings have consciences is, is we are wired that way. It's in our DNA. We are told that, once again, we are told in Scripture that we are created in the image of God. Now, to answer the promise I made a bit ago, what does the existence of a conscience infer? The existence of a conscience infers a God. The existence of a conscience implies the existence of a moral code that strongly suggests the reality of an external absolute, that there's somebody outside of you, me, the church, every other institution in this world there that it infers that there is someone else out there that is giving us some moral code. And the very nature of the universe forces unbelievers to live and to think in ways that are inconsistent with what they say is their belief. And what happens when you look at the concept of conscience and you look at the concept of a moral code that, that our conscience seems to be based on, even the most evil of persons in this world, it, once again, it, it shows that, that there must be something beyond who we are. And the unbeliever must isolate themselves from the rational nature of the universe and lock themselves into what I would call a cell of irrational, uh, irrational, uh, irrationality or irrational thinking. But the rational universe will always continue to seep into every crack, into every corner, challenging the illusion with strong doses of reality that there is nothing, you know, and, and, and what the belief there in uh, those of unbelief is, is that there is nothing beyond themselves or beyond ourselves collectively to determine what is right and wrong. Now, believing that conscience and reason and morality and truth, believing that those things are not there, does not make unbelievers immune to their effects. See, even if you do not believe, truth is going to find a way of, of getting at you. And one of the things that I can be sure of is that once you end up with some little creature that you're responsible for, or the little creatures that you are responsible for have their own little creatures, which are a couple right here that I know, we begin to think about things very, very differently. I, find my, I found myself as I was growing up saying, look, Jay, you know that if you do such and such, that it's likely that such and such will happen. <coughs> I, I get to hear Mike and April, you say those kind of things with, with, uh, with, with uh, Emmett and Clara all the time. And, and when I do, I, you know, they'll start looking at me because I, I get a little smirk on my face and think, something got into those two <laughs> from somewhere. But just because we, we don't believe doesn't make an unbeliever immune to the effects of truth. Unbelievers are like young Neil in the following limerick. It was said by a young man named Neil, who insisted that pain was not real. When I sit on a pen and it punctures my skin, I dislike what I fancy I feel. What the limerick says is that there is reality beyond what we hope and, and desire for reality to be. Now, many today like to think that whatever they choose to believe becomes real for them, but reality grants no exceptions. 
thinking that the stove is not hot, will not keep it from burning the man who puts his hand on it. You can, you can disbelieve in all the, you know, I've said this many times, you can crawl to the top of this sanctuary to the, where the steeple is that, that we try to get the kids' hands to do and, and jump off. And it, it, even if you don't believe in gravity, good luck. There's a truth there. The organic inconsistencies of every other worldview that I have studied actually demonstrates what I believe is the necessity of a biblical worldview. Everyone assumes biblical standards of rationality, of knowledge, of certainty, of absolute morality, of justice at some point in their argument. And when you study the, the other great religions of the world, and, and I only use the term great because of the number of adherents, not that it's a great, though those other religions got it down, but, but the other great religions of the world, when you, when you study them, it's interesting that they all appeal to some form of moral absolute outside of what they're thinking and what their rational mind can get them to. Even when they are attempting to argue against a biblical framework, the problem is threefold in, in unbelief and, and in the beliefs of the other great religions. And the first one is this. Our human brains are wired to think logically and to comprehend such concepts as truth, justice, beauty, morality, love, kindness, and an absolute deed. We're wired that way. I never had to tell my children when so something happens that you don't like, I never had to say, now, now, Victor, what I want you to do is when something happens that you don't like, I want you to look at me and say, that's not fair. <laughs> I never had a teacher to do that. Why? Because there was something wired in her that understood Something natural is being fair and unfair. I can't ever remember having a discussion with any of my children about, you know, uh, until later on in their life when the discussion was, that's not fair, and said, well, who said it has to be fair? I'm paying the bills at my house. <laughs> <coughs> By the way, if you haven't got there as a parent or a grandparent, you will, I promise you. I've always said, you know, uh, the, the whole concept about original sin, which is one of those absolute beliefs in our scripture. I, I, I never, I bet you Rod, that your dad didn't have to say to you, Rod, when somebody takes your toy away from you, I want you to scream, push them, and grab it back away from them. <laughs> We're hardwired that way. We're hardwired to think logically. We're hardwired to know when something is just or not just. We're wired to know when something is beautiful. Now, folks, you, you may not like dandelions. It's a season of dandelions. I was riding along the road the other day, stopped next to a, uh, a spot where, where, the, where the dirt was all tore up, and, and, the, and I saw my first dandelions of the year. You may not like dandelions. I... You know, we work really hard to keep dandelions out of our yard because Gail hates dandelions for some reason. But you know, dandelions are pretty. They're pretty flowers. When I looked at them, I got a smile on my face. I, I can remember paying the kids a penny for every dandelion that they picked and brought to me. Because I knew that there was another dandelion I could throw in the trash and it wouldn't turn to seed. I, I thought that, you know, if I did this long enough, we, we wouldn't have any dandelions in our yard. The, the difficulty was is that the neighbors, they didn't have, they weren't paying their kids enough money to pick the dandelions. <laughs> We're wired that way. The second part of this threefold problem, as, as uh, uh, this threefold problem of, of, under, uh, of, of not having a concept where, where, where there is a God and, and there is something that is absolute is this. All people by nature rebel against the God they instinctively know exists. 
Their opposition to the Bible most of the time is not driven by logical necessity, but quite often, and most often that I see, by prejudice and personal opinion. And what happens in, in so many unbelievers, where, where they become so invested in unbelief that they often rule out any consideration of biblical claims from the start and will not grant them a fair hearing. And in their zeal to suppress the knowledge of God, all these alternatives become concocted and, and, and all of the new philosophies are drawn, but they seem blind to the foundational contradictions inherent in their own theories. Like the fox who's caught in a trap and, and chews off his foot to escape, they, they invent self-refuting philosophies to escape the truth of God. However, anything that is self-refuting, what that means is anything that, that on its surface is, uh, you can tell is wrong, any self-refuting theory is clearly false and will provide no refuge from the wrath of God on the day of judgment. And every attempt to evade the truth all only increases the guilt of those who adopt such philosophies. The third problem is that non-biblical worldviews are based on arbitrary assumptions that cannot be proven and cannot be justified. Folks, let me tell you, one of the worldviews of, of, of many today is that people are inherently good. And if we just re release the good in people, then, then the world will be a happy place. If we make everybody feel good about themselves, then they'll feel good about others and, and we will create a wonderful place. Folks, let me tell you this. I, you know, I, I've learned one thing in my 58 years is people are not inherently good. You know, yesterday when we were cleaning out the fence row for, so that the, at my son's house, he, he bought it. Now all my children are happy homeowners. That's a good feeling when you're a dad. You know, because you realize, you know, if something goes really bad, hopefully they'll let me stay in the bedroom. If, if, if we lose our own, you know, I don't know why it makes me feel so good. But, but yesterday, but they're going to put a, a fence up for my grand dog and, and the, the, the company. It's amazing what we will spend for dogs, by the way. I'm, I'm, I'm still amazed. But, but you know, the, the fence company said, you need to clean this out. And, and you need to make sure that it's all ready for us to come in and auger holes and put fence, you know, posts up and, and put fence up. And, and we're back there cutting trees. And, and I look and I said, you know, son, maybe you better go talk to these people about the trees we're cutting down and, and the things that we're clearing off. Maybe they need to know that, that, they're, that, they're, that what, you know, what's going on back here. And... And one of them, and my son said, well, I, I've got, I had a survey made, and the survey said it went from here to that post right there. And I said, well, the difficulty is, son, is they've been living in that house for 40 years, and they may have a, a differing worldview about where your lot is. And they might be the, the kind of people that, if, instead of like your dad, you know, uh, uh, I remember in high school, we had our neighbor, and our neighbor, uh, we had, she was an interesting. She got better as, as years went by, but, but she, if she would, I know she would camp out in the back, at the back door of her house, and if one of our balls rolled onto her property, and then after she put up the fence, if a ball went over the fence, she would run out, grab it, and take it back in her house. She must have had a basement full of balls. Well, the, the, the time that, that she decided, well, I don't like those Stratton kids. I'm going to put up a fence in my backyard. I'm going to keep those Stratton kids out of my out of my uh, out of my uh, yard. Um, and then then she had this fence put up, and um, and my dad uh, he knew where the pins were. And he looked at the pins, and looked at it back there, and it turned out her fence was about six inches over on my dad's property. Of course, now, this woman had stolen, I don't know how many balls from me. So I looked at Dad and said, Dad, let me go tell her. <laughs> let me go tell her she needs to move that fence. My dad said, no, that's not the way neighbors act. 
I learned something then that that, that, that things are, are not as important as people. You know, uh, here I was, 15, 16 years old. She'd stolen balls for years from me. Ah, this was my chance to get even. But that comes from a non-biblical worldview. A biblical worldview says, you know, that people are more important than things, that there's a way to, to deal with this. And, and the way to deal with it, you know, for, for, for in, in many worldviews is, is, okay, I can call my attorney, he calls your attorney. The biblical world truth, uh, the biblical worldview is, is that once again, we love our neighbor as ourselves, and what would we want that neighbor to do to us, and then we do that. See, that's not, that's not reality in the world in which we live. You see, the Bible often asserts its claims to validity in such phrases as, thus says the Lord, or in God said, and sums it up with the Apostles' declaration that all Scripture is breathed out of God, and it is profitable. And then the Bible tells us that we are called to live by this truth and this reality. See, our Lord and His Apostles they clearly regarded the, that the, the breathed-out Word of God was profitable, as it says there. In other words, the Bible claims to be God's revelation to mankind, and it was confidently regarded as such by our Lord and by all those who sincerely followed Him. Of course, such a claim must never be accepted uncritically. Other writings claim divine origin, such as the Quran or or the Book of Mormon. And by the way, something else that I've had an awful lot of, of Christian people, they'll say, well, I don't believe in, in that work. And I'll ask them, have you read it? And I'll only get two answers. No, I haven't, or parts of it. That we have to be smart enough to understand competing claims. The Bible alone, though, fully lives up to its claim of divine inspiration. It has been rightly said that the Bible is a book that no one could have written. It, and, and, if it, it, and if it would, it wouldn't have been written the way that it was. Let me refer you back to the truth that we rest our faith upon, the Bible. The Bible is 66 books written by more than 30 authors, written over at least 1,500 years, yet it gives a remarkably consistent witness to the sovereignty, the power, the wisdom, the holiness, justice, mercy, and the faithfulness of God, and to the sinfulness and failings of man. Unlike all other human literature, it, it honestly records the faults and the misdeeds of its heroes. Folks, I will, put, I, I will send you to any other foundational work that claims to be divine, and it will treat its heroes as if they never did anything wrong. But the, the, the thing that has always gotten me, the thing that has always persuaded me that the Bible is the real deal is because the Bible is honest in all that it says and all that it does. The Bible is an extraordinary book that tells a unified story of redemption, uniformly affirming the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and man's need of a Savior and God's promise of redemption. And from Genesis to Revelation, the focus of the Bible is on the Savior, not upon you and I. And that is very important. I had to teach my children that one also. You know, for the first four or five years of their life, we treated them like the world revolved around their little backsides. And then for the next 14 or 16 years, we had to convince them that it didn't. You know, think about that. that you know, I love the, uh, I still have the grade cards that from every grade, my, my mom was, was a partial hoarder. <coughs> she, those are the kind of things she saved. I, I, I will never forget the comment on my kindergarten report card. April, I'll have to show it to you sometime if you hadn't seen it before. It's interesting, on, on the back, the teacher in the first grading period says someone had a lot of fun with this child. 
Now that was code for you have spoiled this child to death. And if I could, I would wring his neck. That's, that was the teacher code of the day. And, and then it took, it, it took 15 years for me to figure out that, that the sun did not revolve and set upon me. And folks, that is one of the things that is clear about the truth of Scripture. The Scripture is very clear. There is a God, and He's not any of us. But competing worldviews today want to put man in, want to put you and me in the central position to decide everything that is right and everything that is wrong. One of the extraordinary evidences, I think, of the Bible's divine origin is, is, is that though written over those thousands of years, it accurately predicted the progress of the wickedness that we see in the world today. Romans 1, 18 through 32, for example, declares that men will suppress the truth because of their unrighteousness and traces the progress of this suppression from its origins in refusing to give God the glory and gratitude he deserves and then worshiping the created things instead of the creator of things. In response, that book of Romans says that what God did was give them over to their dishonorable, unnatural passions and further gave them a debased mind to be filled with all manner of evil and malice. Romans 1 assures us that evil men know that God exists and that they deserve his condemnation, yet this only fuels their rebellion against him. Folks, I have known evil people in my life. You have probably known evil people in your life. And I have always been amazed that when I have had the opportunity, and I call it an opportunity, to sit and to talk to somebody who I knew and everybody else around me knew was evil, one of the things that I, I, I have consistently heard, murderers, rapists, horrible crime committers, as I've done ministry in jails, is to have them look at me and say, you know, I deserve what I've got. Where does that come from? It comes from something, once again, deeper, a conscience that infers God. Ultimately, once they are caught, they all know that they deserve exactly what they get. One of the things that I think is interesting, and, and this, may, this, this may paint a little picture for you, is the last book of the Bible we know is the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 9, 21 and 18, 23 says that it tells us that sorcery will be rampant in the last days. Now, you might say, well, I haven't seen any sorcerers around here. Uh... But, but let me also tell you something that to me is really interesting. In the Greek, the word for sorcery is pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from this Greek word. It refers to sorcery or witchcraft or to any kind of deception such as that induced by mind-altering substances. Does anybody think we've got a pharmakia problem in our world today? Our days have seen a rise both in the use of addictive and hallucinogenic drugs as well as the popularity of outright sorcery. It's amazing that somebody would take a word to describe sorcery 2,000 years ago when the Bible was written and then somebody decided, probably not understanding fully Greek, and, and turn that word, which is once again where we get our pharmacy, our word pharmacy, and and pharmaceuticals, I think that that is, that is, that is, that is beyond funny. It's beyond wild. Psalm number two describes our age accurately. It says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed for Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Dear friends, we live in an age where every, where it seems every worldview, everywhere we go, everybody's wanting to, to, to push these bonds away from them. They, they view the, the commandments of God, they view the truth of God as something that constrains them. Let me tell you, dear friends, one of the things that I know that the truth of God 
that when it is lived correctly, instead of constraining us, it protects us. Yeah. It protects us. Have any of you ever driven the coastal highway in California? Yeah. It, it's right along the coast. And, and on, on most of the coastal highway, there, there, there are no guardrails. The first time that I drove on that, I thought, why are they not, why do they not put guardrails up here? Because as you're driving along, I mean, just inches away are 1,200-foot drops or 800-foot drops. You know, the crazy thing about that, and it's so beautiful. I, I, I remember the first time I went on it with Gail. You know, Gail was saying, okay, it looks very good, but you keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> but there are signs all along there that, that, that warn you uh, uh, about the, the, the problem of watching and, and looking at this beauty and driving off into the middle of it. And when they do have guardrails, the guardrails are there to protect people. You know, some might say, well, if I want to drive my car off a cliff, I ought to be able to do it. Well, I guess so, you idiot. And, and we look at those things and, and we laugh and the world has no problem with guardrails and, and warning signs when, when the state highway puts it up. But why do we have trouble with guardrails and warning signs when God puts it up? Why? Because we want to be the masters of our own faith. We want to decide what is right. We want to be like the child that their first words are me. Do it. Whether you can do it better or not. My grandson loves peanut butter sandwiches. Dead and mine. Last night before I went to bed, I, I made a peanut butter sandwich and, and I sat down and I, I told Gail, I said, now I know where my grandson gets it. <laughs> but let me tell you, I make a much better, I make a much better peanut butter sandwich than my grandson does. I've seen the peanut butter sandwich. It's a mess. When he's done, it's on the counter, it's on the floor, it, it's on his hands, it's on, I mean, it's just everywhere. You know, and, and, and that's the picture that I, that, that I see in a world that, that says, I want to do it my way. You know, we, I, I know they take the, you know, let me, let me make you a sandwich. He's had enough of, to realize that that maybe mom and dad can make a better peanut butter sandwich than I can. And someday he will be able to make his own peanut butter sandwich. But your friends, what I'm trying to use by this example is this, is, is once, we, once we get to know the truth of God, once we come to understand its benefits, once we are, are, are not in the way, but out of the way of the truth of God, what happens is, is then we, we can live according to what we think. But our thinking has to be remolded and remade and, 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 and our thinking made within the image of God's thinking and not our own. And dear friends, that takes belief and an understanding in God's truth in order to make that happen. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by, by uh, humanity. But we are told in Scripture that he has become the cornerstone, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name in heaven given among men by which we might be saved. I was very clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Unbelief. It's just untenable to me when I see how the world really works. Without God, without the God of the scriptures that we hold to be true, we live in a world of chaos. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and the second is lacking the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. You get these two right, the likelihood is, is that your life will be filled with peace and your life will be filled with much, much better things than the world of chaos of our Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to, to talk about belief and unbelief. 
And Lord, I have, I have seen those, I've talked to many who, who say that they didn't believe, but still appeal to, to justice and mercy. Still appeal to, to what was right and what was wrong. And, and then, Lord, to realize that, that where that sense of justice came was, was from your word. And whether they knew that they rested upon your word or not, it still rested upon your word. While they might not have been able to see it in their life, it was the firm foundation upon which their supposed unbelief rested. And Lord, while we may not see the foundation of this, this great room that we are in, we know, Lord, that because it is a firm foundation, this building is able to stand. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to, to look once again at, at the foundation of our thinking, the foundation of what we claim to be just, what we claim to be right, what we claim to be beautiful, and realize it rests upon your truth given, received, not invented by us. Father, there might be someone today who would like to pray and, and invite you into their heart in, in new and exciting ways. There might be someone here today, Lord, that would like to pray for our nation or our world. That would like to pray that, that good things occur with, with those around them. But Lord, if that be the case, give them the strength to walk this aisle. There might be someone here today, Lord, that says, I want to follow you in a, in a much more clear way than perhaps I have followed you in the past. If that's the case, O oh Lord, give us the strength to walk this aisle. This is my prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.